In the 1970s, the Sun 47 became the first wide-body plane to enter into service. It was the first aircraft which accommodated a cabin wide enough for a twin aisle. After doing market research, the Boeing company realized that a new wide-body aircraft was needed to replace the 707 and the earlier generation planes. It would provide a twin aisle seating, but in a smaller fuselage than the existing 747 and similar wide bodies. At the time, Boeing came up with the idea of a 7x7. The idea was that it needed to be a short takeoff and landing airliner intended for short distance flights. After receiving feedback from potential customers, they realized they needed to redesign the plane to a mid size transcontinental range airliner. At this stage, the proposed aircraft would feature two engines and possibly even a T tail. Now, by 1976, the Airbus A300 was already a successful aircraft, so the baseline model for the 7X7 was based on the A300. Boeing also decided that it was more beneficial to use two engines instead of three because there was more confidence in the reliability and the economics of newer generation engines. Now, while the airline requirements for a new widebody aircraft remained ambiguous, the 7X7 was generally focused on mid-size, high-density markets. It was intended to transport large number of passengers between major cities, so by 1978, the 7X7 was officially launched as a Boeing 767. Now, the 767 is a long-range airliner, which was Boeing's first wide-body twin jet. It was also their first new model after the introduction of the Boeing 747, and it was designed to take over the market that was serviced by the aging 707 and also the Douglas DC-8. At the time when it was introduced, many airlines were slowly phasing out the L-1011 TriStar and also the Douglas DC-10, and the 767 was seen as a more economical replacement without sacrificing the loss of revenue and unfilled seats. Now, at the time when Boeing introduced the plane to the market, they were also making the Boeing 757 in unison. Both planes had the same design blueprint and technology, which allowed the company to save a whole lot of money on development costs and also bring the plane into market a whole lot quicker. It also meant that the plane would allow pilots to obtain a common type rating to operate both types of aircraft simultaneously. Now, despite the remarkable capabilities of the 767, it was also equipped with a glass cockpit. Computer screens started to replace many of the flight navigation and system dials. This proved to be beneficial as it meant weight could be saved and fail-safe systems could be implemented. But where the plane really shined the brightest was when only two pilots were required to operate the plane, compared to the conventional two pilots and an engineer. Most of the work done by the engineer was integrated into the systems of the aircraft, which meant a tidier flight deck. So the 767-200 entered into service with United Airlines in 1982, and its first commercial flight was from Chicago to Denver. Three months later, Delta Airlines also received the plane, and upon delivery, it was mainly used on domestic routes, including US transcontinental services. American Airlines and TWA began flying the 767-200 in 1982, while Air Canada, China Airlines and El Al began operating the aircraft in 1983. The Boeing company saw huge success from the plane and it received positive feedback. So as always, when you know something is doing good, make it better. Boeing offered an extended range model, the 200ER, in its first year of service. The gross weight was increased and also greater fuel capacity, and the extended range model could carry heavier payloads at distances of up to 11,000 km, and it was targeted at overseas customers. The 200ER entered service with El Al, and it was mainly ordered by international airlines operating medium traffic, long haul distance flights. Now, the 200 variant was the first plane that entered into service. At that time, ETOPS didn't really exist for twin engine aircraft so it meant it couldn't fly more than 90 minutes from an airport. This was gradually increased throughout the 1980s as engines became more reliable and by 1989, it was granted ETOPS certification of 180 minutes. This meant that the 767 could now fly up to 180 minutes from the nearest airfield and it enabled trans-North Atlantic flights. Now, by 1993, all engine options for the 767 were granted ETOPS of up to 180 minutes. 
Initially, the 767 was used on domestic and transcontinental flights. With the extended ETOPS approval, this gave the airlines the freedom and it allowed them to diversify their route network. It also allowed airlines to schedule aircraft with varying capacity over heavy traffic routes. After that came a snowball effect of the 767 variants. Boeing announced a stretched 300 variant in 1983 and an extended range 300ER in 1984. Both of these models offered a 20% capacity increase, while the extended range version was capable of operating flights of up to 11,000 km. Japan Airlines placed the first order for the 300 in September 1983. This was the most popular variant of the 767 family, which accounted for approximately two-thirds of all 767s sold. In 1993, following an order from UPS Airlines, the 300 freighter variant was launched. It featured a main deck cargo hold, upgraded landing gear, and a strengthened wing structure. And finally, in March 1997, Delta Airlines launched the 400ER variant when it ordered the type to replace its L-1011 fleet. Continental Airlines also ordered the 767-400ER to replace its DC-10 fleet. Now, Boeing also offered a 400ERX version. It's a longer-range version of the largest 767 model and it was to be powered by the Rolls-Royce Trent 600 engines. Its range would have been increased to 12,000 km and Kenya Airways ordered three of the 400ERXs to supplement their 767 fleet. However, due to low demand for the plane and the success that the 777 was bringing in for the company, they cancelled the type's development in 2001 and they switched their order to the 777-200ER. Now, in February 2011, Boeing delivered their 1000th 767 to all Nippon Airways. This was a great milestone for the company because they held the record of having produced the only two wide-body jets to have reached this milestone. It also signified a change as the 767 production was moved to a smaller part in Everett to make room for the 787 Dreamliner. Orders for the 767 passenger version started to die down. However, the cargo version is still in demand as is the Air Force tanker version. It's also worth noting that the 767 has been in production for 33 years now, and is planned to be phased out and replaced by the very popular 787 Dreamliner. Having delivered 1,116 planes and operated by 50 airlines around the world, we need to ask the question as to whether there is a future for the 767. Well, with its successor, the dubbed 797, which is planned to enter into service by 2025, there very well could be. The 787 has too much range for what airlines are intending to use it for, which means Boeing could restart the 300ER passenger variant to bridge that gap. There's currently a demand for around 60 aircraft for airlines such as American and Delta. However, just earlier on this year, Boeing said that they're not interested in resuming the production for the passenger variant. However, the freighter division is still going strong. Despite this, however, the 767 is still a very special aircraft. Its continuous production means that it will help ensure a smooth future for the aging aircraft. Boeing has also maintained that there is still demand for the plane, especially in the cargo market. As air freight is slowly getting back on its feet, the market is expected to strengthen as years go by, meaning that it could be in the skies for many years to come. So, in summary, it was the 767 that got many young children into aviation. It's more than just a workhorse. It's reliable, powerful, versatile, and comfortable for passengers in its 232 configuration. Both of the 200s and the 300s fit so well in the network of many airlines. To put it simply, the 767 was a great aircraft that delivered everything it promised to airlines around the world. Thank you so much for watching the Boeing History Timeline videos. To learn more about the history of the planes created by the Boeing company, check out the other videos which are listed in the playlist. Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and for more videos regarding the history of planes and airlines, be sure to subscribe and leave a like. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next Timeline video.